of the chairman, president of trustee committee, Dr. Naveen Mehta, who is right here. And on behalf of Molecule Communications, Ajay Shrivastava and Priya Hyder, we welcome you to Bhartiya Vidya Bhavan. It's a wonderful evening. Non Bollywood program with the Bollywood and the entertainment industry. On behalf of Bharti Vidya Bhavan, welcome, welcome. Today's event is uh, presented to you by Bharti Vidya Bhavan, Molecule Communications, and Priya Heather. Molecule Communications New York Mumbai is a 360 degree media solutions and content company, one of the few which is adept in both events and strategic media relations for brand building, TV, and film production. Their goal is to bring the creative worlds closer through their work. After Ticket to Bollywood and FFFAC with Betsy Johnson Bollywood Style, today's event, Music Beyond Boundaries, is another baby step in bridging the gap between East and West. Please, block your dates for September 28th and 29th for Cinema Beyond Boundaries and part two of Ticket to Bollywood in association with School of Visual Arts and SAG. Priya Heather is New York-based philanthropist and entrepreneur, bringing the best of Bollywood entertainment and sports from India to US for the last five years. At this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Naveen Mehta from Bhartiya Vidya Bhavan on stage. Dr. Naveen Singh Mehta, former chairman Bhartiya Vidya Bhavan and current president of trustee committee is a multifaceted personality. Not only a renowned surgeon and well-known philanthropist, but also one of the most revered community leaders. Dr. Naveen Mehta's dedication and commitment to the promotion and enrichment of Indian culture, education, arts, and literature in North America through various organizations, and particularly Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan US is and has been extremely commendable. Dr. Mehta has always been evidence as a believer in the Bhavan's multifaceted programs and initiatives. Dr. Mehta, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know you have come over here to listen to different people. We call them as a diggish in Hindi, the giant of the giant. Not to listen to me, but on behalf of Bhayati Vidya Bhavan, I welcome all of you. Vidya Bhavan is one of the oldest institutions in New York. Our headquarters is in Bombay, established by none other than Kanyalal Maniklan Munshi about 100 years ago. He decided, after Britishers will leave, the Indian culture might disappear. So he went to all the big people, you know the people like Jawaharlal Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi, and everybody gave 10 rupees, 15 rupees, Gandhiji gave 22 rupees, to create a center for Indian art, culture, and literature. We went, Vidya Bhavan went almost all over the world. We have more than 33 branches, headquartered in Bombay, and we are in New York, where you're sitting on this premises 30 years ago. Bharati Vidya Bhavan is a pioneer in almost every cultural happening occurs in New York City. We have done A.R. Rahman's concert. We have done almost every musical, big people, small people, we call them as a beta, in New York since many years. We have done many functions in um, Lincoln Center, every Fisher Hall, and you just name it. We did uh, even 2,600 years of birth of uh, Mahatma, uh, Lord Mahavira. We have done for Buddha and everyone. So behalf of Bharati Vede Bhavan, I welcome Mr. Salim Merchant, Karsh Kale, and DJ Rekha. It's indeed honor for Vidya Bhavan to host this function over here, and thank you so much. We're here today to talk about South Asian music and its journey from classical music, to cinema, to being a major influence on the global music scene. Music has always occupied a central place in the imagination of Indians. The range of musical phenomena in India, and indeed the rest of South Asia, extends from simple melodies to what is one of the most well-developed systems of classical music in the world. Indian music includes multiple varieties of folk, pop, classical, and R&B. 
India's classical music tradition, including Carnatic and Hindustani music, has a history spanning millennia. Pandit Ravi Shankar, Ustad Zakir Hussain, Bismillah Khan, Shiv Kumar Sharma, El Subramaniam are some of the Indian classic music legends the world has seen. In India, however, music is most commonly associated with film music. Music directors and singers like R.D. Barman, Asha Bhosle, Lata Mangeshkar, Mohammad Rafi, Kishore Kumar have been household names for decades. In recent years, though, we've seen an emerging group of musicians breaking out of film music. Today, we're proud to present three artists who brought Indian and South Asian music to the global scene. I, I want to thank uh, DJ uh, Reka, who's been spinning a little uh, East Room Bhangra uh, for everybody. Mixing a hip hop beat with the sounds of her heritage. Making a uniquely American sound that may not have been heard in the White House before. <laughs> Karsh Kalei refuses the best of East and West, mixing eclectic beats with uh, the sounds of his heritage and creating music that's distinctly his own. Uh, that's a trait, obviously, that's distinctly American. <laughs> No bass also. Very African. No, the last bit you don't do it. You just come on the last F. So musical boundaries in today's world are blurring like never before. And uh, musicians like yourself across the world are creating music that transcends all defined genres. How have you dissolved these boundaries in your own musical journey? Um, I, th I think we, we all uh, are coming up in a very unique time uh, when the internet and social networking are a huge part of sharing music. And uh, you know, for myself, I think that you know, uh, just in the past few years, things have really uh, come to a, a, another place for me in India. And that's not necessarily due to any of the mainstream industry that exists there. It's actually due to people having access to what's out there in the world. So it's, I mean, not just my own music, but people in India are, are and people all over the world have access to everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really opened that door up, whereas in the past we would have had to have gone, gone through those mainstream channels in order to reach different audiences. How did you get uh, the non-Indian audience dancing to Bhangra and Bollywood music? Uh, Rekhati, what did you have to do to make it resonate with them? Um, I don't, I, I guess doing a party in New York, I'm just looking for anyone to walk through, anyone who wants to dance to walk through the door. So I don't think as an, as, a, as an artist or a person who produces events, I really divided things in that way. I think if you play good music and you throw a cool party and you have good, you know, DJs and stuff, hopefully you put the word out, people will come, and if you're good, they'll come back, and if you're not, they won't. Um, in addition to doing Basement Bhangra, um, I did another party with a collective of DJs, Mutiny, which Kirsch had performed at several times, which had more of an electronic bent and was very influenced by the musicians that were coming out of the UK in the mid-90s, um, like Talvin Singh and Nathan Sani. So in terms of like, you know, w w you put your art out there, and whoever accesses it, accesses it. Salim, can we say that Bollywood music has become international? Yes and no. Yes, because uh, we are 1.2 billion of us in our country, right? So every sixth guy on the planet is Indian. <laughs> so it's a lot of people. I'm not counting Indians and yeah. Southeast Asians living outside India. So yeah, in a way, yes. I mean, you know, I, I remember once I was in Paris, and. Uh, 
there was a Tom Cruise there, and, uh, and then suddenly there was Shah Rukh Khan actually walked in a store, and there was just all these people. There was like in, so many Indians there. There was a big traffic jam there because you know, and Tom Cruise was also had walked out of the same store, <laughs> but uh, no one cared for him. And then Shah Rukh Khan said, "I mean." It's just so many of us. What do you say? <laughs> but that's a good thing. I, I feel that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing because, you know, um, A, we are a song and dance nation and um, we love our music. And, you know, for so many of us, it starts in the temples, in the mosques, and, you know, and music is just, it's a very um, powerful force in India. And, uh, yeah, there's no other mu we don't have a music industry. In India, we have a film industry, so all the music is connected to films, and so and that's now called Bollywood. Has the globalization of Indian music influenced the way Indian music is taught and learned? Uh, for a lot of the people out here um, who are not classically trained in Indian music, do you think it's still a starting point for people who want to get into Indian influenced global music? I think that if you want to make Indian music, you need to learn Indian music. I mean, no matter what you're tools are if you're going to wind up becoming a producer or if you're going to wind up making film music or if you're going to be a singer-songwriter. If you're using Indian music, you have to learn Indian music. I mean, that's true with any type of music, but I mean, the fundamentals of what makes it Indian are still true, no matter how you dress it up. I think that's a very key thing which Inkarsh is saying right now, and I would like to reflect upon it. Because it's, I mean, today, computers and all that is, is really like, it's just very accessible, you know, you can just download a loop and, you know, there are so many f uh, uh, libraries that have loops and stuff and you can just, you know, have any software, uh, put a loop, write a, just hum a tune or put another sample in and make music. And that's nice. It's a great thing. I mean, you know, technology is helping people come out with different ideas and stuff. But, um, but knowledge is very important. It's it's really like education is the key at the end of the day. Whether you learn electronic music or you learn classical music, I mean, there are a lot of amazing schools which actually teach you everything. And then there are of course gurus and, and teachers who teach you stuff. But I feel knowledge is the key. Uh, knowledge is power. Yeah. Music is, uh, to, to learn the fundamentals of uh, music is very important, whether it's classical or whatever. So what kind of a relationship do you try to create with technology and live instruments in your music? I'm going to defend the DJ aspect. <laughs> First of all, the minute classical music was recorded, technology entered the space. So the minute um, classical music, once you introduce a format of recording, you change the nature of the experience. So to say that it's a recent thing that live music has turned into beats and loops is, um, it, you know, the, it, it, it coincides with the history of recorded music at large. Um, I think, you know, there's different ways to approach how you make something, and it's true dance tracks are made sometimes with loops, um, or loops are started as an idea, but to get something real, you know, you have to, creating a dance track is like working with a palette of different elements. And the better the elements, the better the final product. So I don't think there's a sort of a judgment or a hierarchy that live music is superior and produced music is in inferior. I think it's um, to each its own piece and, and whatever method is required to make the, f the, final, the final work. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it really depends on what kind of story you want to tell. You know? And, and it's, that's, the, that's the great thing about having this wide palette in front of you. I mean, as in, uh, for me, electronics is just part of the sound. If I'm looking at it as an orchestra, it's just it's a section sitting in front in, in front of me, and there's, there's live musicians, and there's all of this technology, and there's different ways to have them interact with each other. You know, but I think that when you start working with, when you start bringing any live instrumentation in with electronics and the nature of how easy it is to make electronic music, um, one has to have some knowledge of the instruments, has to have some knowledge of the tuning has to have some knowledge of the particular things that the instrument can and cannot do before you challenge it. You know, I mean, there are ways of taking a sample and, and manipulating it and changing the tuning, and you can do things to it that you wouldn't be able to do to a physical instrument. But, you know, especially for someone like Salim, who works with a lot of different musicians working on film music and we're doing background scores, he has to keep all of that in mind. Meanwhile, having this huge palette of technology in front of him to then say, oh, and we can add these sounds and, and now take them into the future. 
Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, even if you're, I'm really happy that my dear friend Wayne Sharp is here, and he's a fabulous composer. When you're, you know, when you're making, when you're scoring a movie, uh, many a times you're, you're if, even if you're writing orchestral music with, with electronic textures, and you have to mock up an orchestra, and that, I mean, that's all technology. The way you're using samples, and you're using a different. Uh, first violin sample, the second violin sample, a third, a, a viola, a cello, a double bass uh, section, whether it's chamber or whatever. And today you have all those samples and you know you can decide what you want to use, what your music is. You can have a woodwind section, a brass section, a different uh, you know, combinations of whatever. And you can do a mock-up and the, a mock-up is only, it's a fantastic thing because it's, it's impossible to call an orchestra to try out an idea. So how wonderful it is to actually have all that in front of you and on a computer as samples and try out that mock-up. And then if it works, then you, you, know, you have different softwares, which, where, which again, technology, have uh, you know, software notate the part for the player or for the section. And then you, know, you, can, you can actually hear your entire piece you know, with orchestra and textures and tones and sounds and everything in front of you. And then you can always call the real orchestra and mock up and, and replace the mock up. So technology is fantastic. It's, it's got to be, if you use it properly, you can, you can really create wonders. And today it's, it's extremely important time, time saving and, uh, and really effective to, to use technology in any music, whether it's film, um, you know, dance, whatever it is, it's, 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 it's the key. You have to, everyone does it. Everyone uses a, a software like Logic or New Android or Pro Tools or whatever to create a mock-up and then, and then they call the live guys. So it's, it's in combination. It's not different. It's just that we are blessed that we have the technology in front of us to try out how the orchestra is going to sound and then get the real guys in. So technology is the new instrument? Technology with soul, yeah. <laughs> Well, just, I'm going to insert a little um, factual note. Up until 1991 in India, there was a, a limit on what kind of technology could be imported into India in terms of actual gear. So you can hear it in the sound. I think that, you know, sometimes I listen to the older stuff and I'm like, where's the bass? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Why didn't they use a click? Um, yeah. But now I have to say that everything that comes out of India has the sound quality and the boom and everything that as as sounds as good as anything out there because those those barriers are eliminated and it's really given an opportunity for you know we say it's Bollywood you know international music absolutely because it, it it can hold to those standards so I think you know that that happened just sort of on the technical governmental level that you know <laughs> people had to smuggle things in <laughs> yeah, into the true. recording studios that's so um, true. So. Did anyone in the audience have any questions? Um, notation. How does the notation differ with Indian music and can it be found on Sibelius? And how does it differ from? Do you mean Indian notation? Yes. Uh, no, unfortunately it's not found on Sibelius yet. But uh, that's a great... There, uh, the, the, there is a difference in notation and there is notation. Yes, um, it's a scale base. So, uh, just like CD, I mean, it's it's do re mi, just like how you do this sari gama bada nisa. So everything is written in uh, in do re mi but form. It's not, it's not the regular diatonic scale that we use. It's, there just seems to be more notes in between. Yeah. So uh, in, in, in classical music, everything is based on a scale, which is, which is called a raga, and uh, you know, it, there are millions of combination combinations, and then it depends on what the raga is. And sometimes, if you're using a sharp note or a flat note, there's a sign for that. Against the against the notes. So let's say if it's do re mi fa and you have a sharp re, then you can have that sign on that. Okay. It's not like the regular sharp or flat sign. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's got symbols and it's uh, uh, Indian classical music has its own rotation. And it's pretty uh, intense. Where can that be found? That's um, actually a really good idea. Uh, you know, yeah. Back home, we have a company, and we're going to actually develop this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. There you go. Good question. Uh, you know, I have a lot of friends here who are actually not from India, and they've taken Indian music to a different level. I have somebody here who actually plays Kirtan and the Maha Mantras with his whole brand. 
you know, and a lot of other people, and they all kind of here because they want to know. They are inspired by India, but they have knowledge of music that is here. And what is it that you guys, all three of y'all, would give any kind of tips to them? Because they do get inspired by Indian sounds, and you know they do use it, but they don't have enough knowledge as much as you guys have because of your background. So, any tips for all of those people sitting here, please? I would, I would say that. Uh the more important thing, especially when you're starting to make your own music, I mean, it's one thing to play kirtan or, you know, play kawali or choose a particular style of music, but when you're starting to make your own music, I think it's it's important to constantly ask yourself what it is what it is that you want to say. Because there's always people that know more than you. There's always people that are better than you uh, skill-wise or knowledge-wise. Um, but what will set you apart as an artist is is being able to tell your stories, being able to tell your stories in the most eloquent way, way possible. And that really comes from your own knowledge of yourself, of constantly asking that question, because I think oftentimes artists don't. They, they wind up getting caught up in, the, in the, either the technique or the repertoire they're being taught. You know, and that will only take you so far. It's like learning the classics. You learn all of the classics, but if you want to write your own novel, you have to, you have to go with it. You know? And I think that's the best thing I can say for anybody who's making music, whether it's taking Indian influences or anything like that, I mean, I, I think it's that's only one part of what you do, and the other part is yourself. How is that all coming together within you to say one thing? So uh, with a lot of these bands coming, like Shy and Funk, and then Nandi Shrikar just launched her album in India, and the whole movement going on, on at Blue Frog in, in Mumbai, do you anticipate a music industry being generated within the next five, ten years in India? 100%. There's, there's not only that, there's a company called OML that is doing so many festivals. There were so many festivals happening in India. I mean, this was never heard of. I, I never imagined that, you know, that Bollywood is going to be, and I can see that we definitely are going to have a parallel industry now. And it's a great time right now because there are, there's N7, which is a huge festival, music festival. There are, Kush will tell you more about it because he, he's, <laughs> he's headlined many festivals. Uh, but there is a there's a parallel industry now existing. There are a lot of artists who are, I mean, uh, Kirsch Kale has been to Bombay 13 times, and none of them were for Bollywood in the last year. So he's a guy who's going to answer that. Yeah, no, there's definitely a, um, a huge movement of uh, independent artists. You know, people who are doing their own thing, like Sharon Funk, and I mean, uh, such a wide variety of uh, a palette of uh, of artistry. You know, that some are drawing from Bollywood, some people who work in the Bollywood industry as well, but are now finally getting an outlet. Including um, me. Including <laughs> and, Yeah, I mean, there's so many different <laughs> artists, and, I, and there's so many different artists that I've known over the last decade that spent five, ten years performing in front of th two, three hundred people in clubs, and that was the largest audience that they would get. And now, all of a sudden, there's this whole series of festivals that they're playing in front of 15, 20,000 people. And you know that's very encouraging, and that's that's also due to the fact that there's a new generation that are tech savvy and they know what they want, and they're not allowing the industry to dictate their tastes. They're, they're getting the choice, so now the, the now the choice is even bigger. Yeah. You want to listen to Radio Mirchi and hear the latest Bollywood stuff? You can. You go online. You want to check out the latest Sharon Funk video? You can. Yeah, I think also you know just back to the 1.6 billion people or how <laughs> the zillions of people in that in that that pie and you know and the largest way. middle class uh, and a, 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 a huge young demographic and what I see is developing with uh, only much louder NH7 in these festivals there are parallel entertainment things that are happening there's a comedy scene in India um, that's growing and there are college festivals very similar the idea of festivals is growing internationally across the board. It was all, it used to be a, a European thing. It's even grown in the States. So that's a worldwide phenomena. And um, the people who are behind these festivals are international because yeah. they're transnational. So they're bringing their sounds and the music and, and people are listening. There's no delay in, in, in listening, getting things. So India is also a huge market for, for non-South Asian DJs. That's true. Um, and, and other artists, and they yeah. see that as a market as well, mm -hmm. and that is outside of Bollywood. So there's d different things happening there. So we are seeing a lot of artists, not just within the South Asian community, but also from the West, who are touring India and also going there for collaborations. Um, what advice would you give to the musicians here um, 
if they want to explore music in India and be part of these festivals and collaborate. Are we talking about Western musicians? That's right. Who want to go to India and explore the music? I would just say go. I mean, it's <laughs> it's kind of a no brainer. There's I mean, there's a scene. There's a, there's a, like like you, like Rico was saying. There's a huge scene. I mean, there's just for heavy metal fans. <laughs> There's a gigantic heavy metal That's scene true. in India. So when a band like Iron Maiden or Metallica come to India, they get a huge 20, audience. 20,000 crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Adams is big and possible. <laughs> 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 I'm not kidding. It's the biggest Still? song you can play. Still? Summer of 69. Oh, really? But those are big names, and there's a nostalgia attached to some of those but artists. That's what about like young emerging artists? Well, here? that's the thing. Still now, I mean, Skrillex was supposed to come. I don't know if you, if you know who Skrillex is, but Skrillex was one of the first electronic artists to be nominated for a Grammy. And he was supposed to be coming last year. There was some schedule conflict, but people like Tiesto, pe there were people, all I mainstream artists that are coming latest, over to India. The latest was uh, Swedish House Mafia. Yeah. Swedish yeah. House Mafia, yeah. And there were 44,000 people in Mumbai City. Mm -hmm. The traffic was completely uh, chaotic. I mean, that city went nuts that one day. Because, you know, Mumbai has 28 million people. I mean, now, counting Greater Mumbai and all that. So it, it went mental, and you know, the Swedish House Mafia came in the middle of the city, they, they, they got a venue and they performed, and 44,000 kids turned up. Yeah. But j just for the, the non people not on that level um, in terms of their career, if you want to, and I say this to anyone who sits here and wants to, you can't sit here and dream about India and making music there. You have to go there. People always say to me, why aren't you working in, in Bollywood? Or why? I go, because I don't live there, you know? And I'm very committed to the work I do here. And I have been there and I have done shows there. And it's, it's a choice that I'm fortunate enough to make. But I think if, if, if you want to get down with any scene, you have to be in the scene or be part of the scene. And I think it's pretty easy and small and accessible, especially the, the non-Bollywood scene of musicians. You just go to one or two parties, you'll meet everybody. I mean, let's ask, uh, you know, but discuss. I know I, I can see a couple of people who've been to India from here, Raj and uh, you've been there, uh, you know. So why don't you why don't you share your experiences? But, uh, how was it? Go ahead. You must. Yeah, why I mean, did you reach out? Me too. To, me too. Me too. You know me too. Me performed at the Blue Frog. I can you that. guys yeah. be really honest? Because so. I wonder, like, some of those experiences were positive and some of them might not have been. So if you want to talk about yeah, it. please. You must because you know that this is there are a lot of other people probably here in the crowd who who are contemplating to go there and to check it out? When I went to India, I prepared by sending out uh, an email to my email list and just saying, I'm going to India, who knows anybody there? And people actually responded. They said, contact this person, this person, this person. And I got a, a list of like 35 people in the industry. And I just called. I went prepared. Um, I also went with the intention of getting a record deal. Which, um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's a different situation now. I, I don't I don't think record deals are really it's, necessary. Yeah, I mean, it's if you have it's the like I said, there's no record industry. There's yeah. only there's only film. <coughs> the scene yeah. is film scene, but the record scene will ha which will happen. I mean, there's a there's a lot of, there's a very different scene which is happening right now with, with the whole festivals and uh, you know different venues playing different music. There's a huge non-film scene happening. From the time you came in last, yeah, yeah. there's a completely different scene right now. Yeah. It's 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 really buzzing and it's great, and uh, it's 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 a, it means something right now. And a lot of it's based on singles now. I mean, people we're not necessarily bound to the 74 minute disc, or you can put out a new song every day. You can you know there's, we're not bound to the album anymore. So now it's it's people are able to invest in an artist and follow them through their journey over a few months as they keep on releasing records and stuff and that's you know what exists here it, it's, it exists there as well and that's that's the cool thing about all of a sudden seeing the same thing happening all over the world i mean i think that with anything it's like things have to line up at the timing you know like you went there and maybe it was too early or you got to link with the right people and have the right combinations of things happen to get to the next to the for things to really happen. I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, it's it's art and business, and sometimes they're oil and water, you know? So, and it's true, what's happening, there is no music industry in India. The music industry in this country is completely self-combusting. The, the record deal is not the, is no longer the hope, and that's a very new thing, and it's a whole different way of thinking. 
I don't know how much preparation I did. I just kind of reached out to everybody I could reach out to. Um, and I just went out there because I was curious about it. <clears throat> My family's from there, so but I hadn't been there in about eight years. So more or less, I didn't know at all what was going on there. I was working in the uh, music industry here in New York. And uh, I just went out there <clears throat> and uh, you know, I just went out there like a sponge, and, and it was amazing. It was amazing. I met a lot of people. I hung out with Rega. <laughs> That's we actually how we got like, to know each other. Yeah. And we did this gig for 9,000 people. Yeah, and I've, uh, <laughs> I'm not at all uh, an MC, but that was the one night in my life that I was a hype man <laughs> for Rega. So crazy stuff happens out there that you would never expect. Um, I, I wouldn't say to go anywhere with any kind of expectation. I think that's the main thing. And I think what Salim was saying before, by the way, I met Salim out there and I learned a lot from spending time with Salim that I use on a daily basis. So, um, <clears throat> and there was a lot of really welcoming people there. And to keep it real, just like anywhere else in the world, it's still a business. So we're talking about two things. You're talking about the art of music and then you're talking about the economics, the business. So being out there as an artist, was incredible because I learned so much about music, I learned so much about myself and I think ultimately what Selim was saying earlier is that's what's important, to stay true to yourself because then you're, you're not worried about what might happen or well, what do I do when I land, it's just, no, just go, be yourself and things will happen. Um, as far as the business goes, <laughs> <laughs> All right. yeah that's a completely different story. Uh, essentially it works completely different than it does in America. But that would be the same as if you went anywhere. I did a few gigs, I did some programming for some film, I linked with some musicians, I worked on some music as an artist. I'm sorry, how and long, in, in how, what kind of time period was that? Last time I was there was about a month and a half, the time before that was six months. But that's then. something, because it's really difficult to <clears throat> just jump into a different place and, and get stuff done. And program a couple of tracks, and this, that, and the other. So. Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was definitely blessed. and. You said something about timing. I think that's everything, you know. So you can prepare as much as you as you possibly can. You can work every day. Essentially, you have to live it. If you if this is not a business you join because you want to make money. If you want to make money, this is the worst possible business you can probably join. But you just do it if you love it, you know. And things happen, and you're never gonna know when it's gonna happen or how it's gonna happen. You just you just have to go and do it. So just just do it. If you're thinking about it, just do it. I'm gonna Sorry guys, I'm going to pick a, uh, thank you Raj, I'm going to pick a little minute to also uh, invite uh, the fantastic Wayne Shaw because he's composed uh, four soundtracks uh, of five uh, in, in, and five amazing movies and the score has been fantastic, Bollywood. Uh, Bollywood movies and I've really loved his work and he also happens to win a Filmfare Award in India which is equivalent to the Academy here. So, Wayne Shaw. Please, all everyone is here. Kirsch, I still hear Milan, your track, and I still get goosebumps to this day. It's really had an influence. I've been going back forth to India for about uh, about ten years. And my first film was Gangajal. Did the soundtrack for Gangajal, and uh, being from being from the U.S. and just going over to. India for the first time was just quite an amazing experience, and uh, you know everybody said, "How'd you get you know, being a white guy? How'd you ever get it? <laughs> <laughs> doing this?" And it, it's just it's been life changing experience, um, and I just can't even tell you what's happened. I've been over there probably 13, 14 times, and uh, spent a month or two at a time, and uh, it's I've just brought back all this experience, all this music, all this talent, these amazing people that have just just over there and just sharing their, their talent and, and their experiences so freely. And I felt so, so I've never felt so accepted before in any, any other country um, in my life. I've been around the world quite a bit. So it's been a great experience. And the challenges you faced, uh, you know, working with Indian musicians, <laughs> um, you know, Basuri players and uh, you know, sitar <laughs> players. And because your score has had a lot of Indian, yeah. in, Indian instruments and, you know, you've done a lot of. Um, Indian st uh, music in, in your score. So, how have you? What is what is what have been the what has been the challenging part there? Uh, the challenging part, as far as with the scores, um, I, I, it's it's gone been everything from having orchestras over there to working with 
the top, top musicians in India. And I've just been blessed to just have these people walk in the room and, and perform uh, my music. I think... Uh, how do you, how do you wow, prepare with when you know when you're writing something and you say you have a sitar player come into the studio or is, is there anything that you particularly uh, or is there any experience that you draw from before you <laughs> besides <laughs> Malik Salim? Well, I, I think there's a difference. I, I think there's a difference in. I'm just going to bring this mic up so I'm to slouch here. Um, He's very I think tall. There's, there's a difference in in a Western way of thinking in, about the score and going over to India, especially 10 years ago. I mean, I, I've actually seen it evolve yeah. and change from 10 years ago, especially with background scores. I mean, I, my going back from when A. Ramon did Tal, that was life-changing for me when I heard that music. That just basically changed my life. And I think that um, going over there from a Western point of view, it's a different experience the way, the way Indian musicians and Indian uh, other composers and songwriters and performers think it's all it's it's you have to so you have to take all that into account um, in, in recording sessions they may hear something totally different and I think the biggest thing for me is letting go if, if I have a score it's here this is the way we have it written we've got, I've got you know what came back from Prague had you know 50 musicians on this and I'm saying to this guy this is how I want the melody we just let him go and it does his thing and it's better than what I I would have had. So I think with India, there's also a big thing about letting go of the music and letting it happen instead of being so precise and so organized. And I think it's just real, just magic happens every time I've been over there. You know, my experience with working with, uh, especially Indian classical musicians, uh, you know, oftentimes you can, you can write, you know, you can write a great melody or you can, you know, come up with a great theme, but that real magic moment usually comes out of something spontaneous that they do. You just kind of allow them to do, or you just tell the engineer to keep recording, and let, them, <laughs> let them go. And I already heard what I did. I'm going to get it later. You know? <laughs> but you let you allow it to happen. You know, and you allow that ma magic to, to spontaneously happen. You know, that's that's the beauty of, and that that comes back to as well that that idea of knowledge, that idea of when you're working with musicians who have that ocean of knowledge, then that's what they're able to bring to the table. Yeah. And also going back and forth, I mean, the, the distance now has just been just completely changed because, you know, Kirsch, he's all back and forth. Salim, we, 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 we call each other, we have different sounds, we send music back and forth every time we're there. It's, you know, you, you're right about it. You actually go to, go to a party or go to a session, everyone's there. It's a very, it's, it's, just an, it's, it's incredible. All the people, all the musicians on the top, it's just, it's, it's just an amazing place, and it has really changed my life. So, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, man. I wish you could have it on film with you sometimes. So. It would be nice to have it on film to dance and dance. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll score that film. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remix it. <laughs> so, the old, going back to Bollywood, old music was based on ragas. Not all, but yeah. Some most of most actually there was only more. I mean apart from that, there was Madan Mohanji who was really yeah. like the guy. Right. Yeah. So uh, so now is it is it kind of similar or do you guys work with ragas? We try to or? like Suleiman and he tried to push that in. Uh, like in Gurwar we did uh, Rasia, you know, which was uh, in Puri Adanashri and recently uh, we've done a song in Yemen and, and you know which is uh, for Satyagra this film. So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, because we've stu I've studied classical music, Indian classical music. There's a, a strong and sometimes you you know see you got to understand that the movies have changed, the stories have changed, the actors have changed, times have changed. You know, so that that kind of music, with, at that point there was no uh, you know hip hop, there was no inf there was no other influence. There was classical music. That's it. Back in the day. And of course, there was the Beatles, and you know there was rock and stuff. But you know, if the movie was kind of Indian centric, then there was no need for that. So that's why the music was made in that era. But talking about it right now, yes, there is a definite. I mean, there's a lot of effort. Like Shankar is a fantastic singer, he's a great classical singer, and he pushes it. He pushes it in. Um, uh, so Lemon and me are fortunate to learn classical Indian classical music, so we do push it in. And so some people who, who are not, like Pritam, I don't see him, he's not, but he's, compo he's managed to compose a couple of beautiful, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, rag-based songs. And, but it's not just us. When we're doing music for a movie, it's the movie. 
the movie has to allow you to make that music. You know? If it's some cheesy, you know, uh, girl meets boy kind of live in relationship, it's hard to write intense songs like that. You know, and ultimately you're writing songs for movies. You can't just throw Salim, it. Salim, isn't it what I've noticed in, in Bollywood is that there are a lot more period films? Are there? No, or not enough? Because after Judah, there was no. Not really? Because then I would think if there are more of those kinds of movies, yeah, that would give you more. After Judah, but there was like, it's been six years now. Okay, maybe Judah. I'm just thinking about Judah. Yeah, Akbar. it's sad. It's, 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 yeah. How does that tune come to you? Like, can you tell us some interesting stories about some of the tunes that Maybe a little bit of the same. Maybe a little bit of yeah, it's, there is no such rule. I mean, it, it sometimes, you know, you're struggling trying to write a tune in the studio for hours, trying different chord progressions, and you know, it's just not happening. And then just when you <coughs> get out and sit in your car from the studio, and you know, you, you're driving in the silence, that's when it comes to you. So it, it really, it's just a, it's a matter of, it has to come to you whenever it has to come to you. Sometimes you spend days thinking about a song when you have, but. It's not necessary when you have time, you can do the best stuff when you don't have time. And, you know, when you have just someone just tells you, like, you've got to do something now. You sometimes come out with the best stuff. So it really depends. Also, those tunes have to be like, popular, right? I mean, they have to become popular. I also come up with tunes, but I don't think they're ever going to be popular. <laughs> That's sad that you say that because, you know, uh, if you believe that they can get popular, then, you know, they should. Are you making music for other people or for yourself? then I think they should. Because if you like them, there's a big chance that people will. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick question to follow up about, uh, you know, how you said non-Bollywood movie uh, music is making its space through festivals. Uh, on the mainstream media, I mean, there's Coke Studio, which you guys have been on, there's Durist. Do you think there's more programming that's going to come up that will allow space for that type of music to be on the mainstream? Yeah, I think that the more and more that there are now, there are going to there's going to be. Uh, I think Pepsi is also doing a new uh, Pepsi Studio. Yeah. Pepsi <laughs> Studio. <laughs> yeah. But you know, these are still this is still was still scratching the surface. I think the kinds of programming that the kinds of really interesting programming that's coming out now because it's not just about showcasing other types of music. It's about getting the opportunity to be able to spend a half an hour with an artist, where you never really got that chance before. I mean, you would see a concert, or you would see a, a, a clip from a film, and that was the only real music you could really experience on television. So now, to be able to see an artist go through, you know, go through their day, spend the time with them in their stu in the studio, see them collaborate with different artists, see them on stage live in the Coke Studios environment. I mean, these are all uh, different avenues for people just to understand music differently and so a new audience is growing and demanding more out of their out of their programming so after a while you know even something like coke studios won't be enough and they'll want to see more they'll want to they want to get more from their artists and 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 that's that's important because before it wasn't you know like salim was saying most of the time we forget about who the composer is we forget about who you know so to be able to actually invest in the artist is what these shows are allowing and you know, we're you definitely going to see it growing. Beverages have a lot to do with music <laughs> <laughs> in many ways. No, I mean that in a real way, not just Coke, True. Pepsi, I, and Durist. I did, Coke, I, think, I did a Coke and Shivas gig in the same week. Yeah, it was, and it was a good no, combo. But, but liquor <laughs> brands have to figure out a way to advertise, but not even liquor. Somebody has to unfortunately underwrite this stuff. And if they're going to do it for the connection of their brand, it's allowing an opportunity. So um, because there are no labels and because the film studios have their agendas, um, brands are looking for innovative ways to connect with different audiences. And whether it's Red Bull here or Coke Studios, which did some amazing work in India as well as in Pakistan too, um, or you know, Duris, which is like amazing idea of taking musicians and making them collaborate on a song and filming the experience. Um, you know, and, and it actually won an international prize somewhere. Yeah, that's true. The tourist won the best. It won the best uh, series of uh, also uh, like best branded series. Best branded, branded, branded series, series in Cannes, which is yeah. on an international, um, you know, an international uh, arena, and it goes back to as the person making the music or consuming the music. Like you know, it's got a. It comes down to does it sound good, you know. Uh, there's a number of film composers here who aren't Indian. Uh, a group of which I'm part of. 
Um, and from hearing you talk, it sounds like maybe, uh, and I know nothing about Bollywood, uh, it, sounds, it sounds like a Bollywood movie, the music is not made, uh, is made in some way that's not uh, very similar maybe to the way a Hollywood or sort of a New York indie movie that a lot of us have worked on. Can you guys maybe talk a little bit about the process? Um, so there are two parts to it. Uh, one, one is the songs. One is one, uh, one is the songs, which is basically done before the film is shot, and uh, then the post production part, which is the background score. So uh, it's uh, you know the, the story is given to you, and you obviously have the situations where the songs are chopped out, and uh, so you write a melody, which is kind of, or there is a piece. There's there's some lyrics which are written. So you. Um, one has to basically do the song, whether you, st you write the lyrics or do the tunes. You do a scratch melody and the composer and the director likes it and then you elaborate and then you produce it and then you get a singer to sing it or you sing it yourself and that's how the songs get done. Once the songs get done, then we do the score and the score is typically, I think, I mean from what I understand how Wayne does his scores, I mean we do it pretty much like that, which is, uh, I don't know how, I mean, this is this is how we do it. Like we do a mock-up, which is um, first when we when the film comes to us, it's on an MP3 form, MP MPEG format, and or a uh, or it's a, or some video format, and then you put the video, and it's always broken into reels, which is if it's let's say a, a two-hour film, it's typically ten reels, or it's a uh, every reel is like twenty minutes, so eight reels or six reels, and. And then you start scoring the scenes. You chalk out which scenes you want to score, and so you mock it up. You do the mock up of that on the on the keyboard, on the on your software. And uh, uh, some parts sound good, so some you leave them the way they are. But sometimes you like to always add an orchestra, and of course that depends on the budget. Mm -hmm. And um, and there is a you know every cue has its own uh, requirement. Some some cues require a live uh, flute or a live this <coughs> or a live that. And once that's done, then I'm just going really quick. Once that's done, then you know you do a premix of that, and you do stems of that. So you know, if even if you're using 108 tracks or 120 tracks, you break it down to 32 tracks, and those 32 tracks you send out to the studio for to do a 5.1 mix, and uh, yeah. And then you mix that against dialogues and effects. I guess I was wrong about that because that sounds exactly like everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only difference is the element of this is the song the elements. Right. Yeah. So if you were to be working on a musical, that's that's what you would have to do. One last question here. Thank you for giving me the, uh, the last question. Um, <laughs> and thank you again for being here with us today. Thank you, Father. I'm sure we all do as well. Um, there is an increasing uh, phenomena in the United States, North America, and uh, globally of the transformational type festival, and uh, this is increasingly the, uh, the arena that I find myself in, and, and many uh, bass music producers do as well. And I wanted to uh, ask you, um, especially Karsh, uh, with respect to uh, bass music and transformational culture, how you're seeing that unfold in India. Well, I think that what's happening over here is is kind of its own phenomenon, and it has to do with what, what the particular culture needs. You know, I think in America, you know, it just say I'd say 15 years ago we started seeing this real kind of resurgence of yoga and and that element of lifestyle and and music and, and things like that kind of coming together um, and then I mean and at that particular time in bass music was somewhere else it was you know we were going to Burning Man and we were you know checking stuff out in clubs and stuff like that but seeing it all come together at these festivals like the beloved festival and I mean there's a lot of different festivals that are uh, the, the main ones not coming to mind right now, but there's the Tadasana festival that's at, that started last year, and I think it's an amazing thing. And I, I think that there are elements of that coming back into India, but but these are also, you know, I, I think I mean if you're talking about the practice of yoga, I mean you people go go there to study to find the to to learn the fundamentals. Now what happens with that culture? What happens with that uh, lifestyle? Outside of India is is its own thing, and I don't, you know, I don't think I think now that it's become it's come here, it's an American thing. It's part of American culture. Thank you. Wow. Um, those were some great questions. Um, I would like to thank uh, Salim, Karsh, and uh, Rekha for being here with us. Hope you all feel enlightened. I do. <laughs> And I would also like to thank all the volunteers who spent um, 
endless hours trying to put this um, event together. Thank you. I would like to request Ajay Shivastav, <laughs> Priya Haider, Vishal. Please come near the podium, please. Vishal is all close here. Because of their effort, this event was successfully organized at Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan. And uh, with their permission and uh, with Dr. Navin Mehta's permission, I have no hesitation to announce that this Music Beyond Boundaries program is going to continue every possible opportunity maybe in a couple of months or every quarterly we are going to have one session of panel discussion and that's what Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan is meant for. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. I would request Ajayji to say a few words. Ajayji. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Salim, Karsh, Rekha, thank you very much. You know what I'm feeling right now is we should order pizza guys and just sit, hang out and listen and talk. Seriously. And that's where I'm and beverages. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so <laughs> because you guys have been so amazing and the audience, I'm sure you guys got your nuggets. But I want to thank Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, Ravinji, thank you. Uh, without you, this would have not been possible, Deepak. And you know guys, one thing we all need to take a moment, everything starts with something, right? This whole thing happened because of this man, this man with the hat, yeah. 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 who made one call to me one day saying, Ajay, you know what? Salim is coming here and Karsh is here and you know we have Rekha and we have so many people. Let's do something. Yeah. There was one call a few weeks ago. So, Vishesh, and you know what? I want, this is my dream for Vishesh, guys. I know we are going a little over time, but I have to say that. I'm waiting for the day to buy a ticket and go watch his movie in Times Square. That's my dream, Vishesh. Yeah. Yeah. Also, thanks to my beautiful partners, Priya and Suman, for you know supporting us in what we are doing. And thank you, Sharda Ji, for coming here. This was such an honor. Thank you so much for being here. And all of you guys have been wonderful. And yes, we did go a little uh, more than what we expected in terms of time, but I'm sure you guys got enough nuggets whatever you all came for. Thank you. Thank you, all of us, for being here, please. All of you guys.